what first all starts out looking like an alternate fantasy ending to Titanic where he's like on the door and she's on the door and you know she warms up his heart so that he can push the door to shore it like gosh door and shore Hey, this is the Sword in the Pen Reflections. It is my casual alternative to the more formal channel, Sword in the Pen, link up there. So we're talking today about season one, episode six of Shadow and Bone, the series, and comparing it to the novel. I am an editor and I have, I'm reading this book and watching the series simultaneously, having never read or watched either of them before, and kind of going over some of the things that were improvements or maybe they, <laughs> they ruined certain things in the changes of writing because the author was involved in the writing of, well, she was obviously the author of the book, but she was also involved in the writing of the series. And a lot of people said that the series is an improvement. And I have to agree, the series has done a lot to really enrich this story. But in this case, there are a few things I'm finding in the series that weren't quite as good as they were in the book. And we're gonna go over some of those. So the first thing in the book, it's all from Alina's perspective. So you're starting to see some reflection on her part, thinking back to how she was manipulated by the Darkling and being aware of how that manipulation is still working in her and she has to fight it. And I really like that. That's hard to translate onto screen, but I, you know, they, there maybe have been ways that they could have done it. I'll have to think about it a little bit more. But in the book, we see her having a desire to go back and ask for forgiveness to get back into the Darkling's good graces, but then her being aware of, I can't believe that I'm thinking that, even though I know about everything that he's done. And I, and it's stupid of me to think that. So I really like that. And I do wish we could see something like that happening on screen. Like I said, I'll have to think about how, how that might be portrayed. If you've got some ideas, I'd like to hear about it in the comments, maybe. Another thing that was in her head in the book, but not in the series, is she felt like... She was surprised she was okay on her own. So she was always afraid that, of what it would be like to be left alone. She always had Mal or she always had the other orphans or, you know, the other cartographers. And now she's completely on her own and it's not so bad. So I liked that a lot. And we definitely didn't have that in the show. Now, in the show, one of the first things that we see is that after she escapes from uh, the, the trunk that she's been hiding in, she tries to go and buy um, some fruit and it's interesting that she picked a dragon fruit and she's her money is refused. Well, she doesn't offer money, but the guy who's selling them says shoe money is no good here and sends her on her way. And that actually made me remember something that, okay, so she's Shu Han. So it, this is something she cannot hide. She can't just blend in with the crowd, which is actually something she actually, she deliberately does in the book. And I didn't see her trying to figure out some way to get past this or standing up for herself in any kind of way. And we see that a lot in the book. And I know that this is not an obstacle, but we see her standing up for herself more frequently. And this is like the one thing we don't see her standing up for herself in in the series at all. So I think I would have liked to have seen some of that fiery self-defense that we have in the book, have that in the series, especially with regards to her being Shu Han. Okay, next, the way that she and Mal uh, find each other, well, Mal finds her, is roughly the same as it is in the novel. I think I would have appreciated, um, I, I don't know, it just felt like, how did he know that she was gonna come out of town, like right on that side? I would have liked to have had her maybe like going through the woods more or something and then he catches up to her or he figures out exactly where she's gonna go. Something like a callback to how he knew where she would be because I think he 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 finds her in this like ditch or ravine, you know, like she's gone through the, anyway, you get it. Uh, the, I'll show it on screen. <laughs> Uh, but earlier in the series, in the show, we saw him tell her, I always know where you are because you like to roost. You like to go to a high place. So I would have liked to have seen that come back, but that's just a minor thing. As for her interactions with Mal, this I do like what they've done in the, the show as opposed to the book. So in the book, they're immediately like kind of angry at each other um, because the last time that they spoke was in the little palace and they were kind of blaming each other. Like, you know, you didn't talk to me, you didn't send me any notes, you know, and you've been living it up here in the palace or whatever. And that's continued for what felt like a very long time. 
And I realize that reading something takes a lot longer than to see it portrayed in film, but it still just felt like this went on and it was this tension and you just, you wanted it to go away. And it, it felt like it, it didn't actually finally go away, not completely, until I think it was when the Butter Festival happened or whatever. Anyway, it just felt like it, it carried on. And this is an immature sort of an argument. And in the series, I am so happy to say they did not have this lingering tension like that between them. He it kind of comes up briefly, but they both realize that they their mail was being intercepted and they were both manipulated and they get over it. And then later, so in the book, Mal gets all <laughs> butthurt that Alina might have been in a relationship, a romantic relationship with the Darkling. And she's all upset about that. And But in the series, she's worried he'll be upset about it and he's surprised but he's like, it's none of my business. Like you had no reason to be faithful or loyal to me, which is nice because that is a more mature way to go about it. And I think that it, yeah, it just portrays these characters as being more uh, savvy to the world and more aware of, of other people's possible situations. So, you know, taking into consideration what somebody else was going through, which is something that well, an emotionally mature person does. <laughs> Another thing that the book did that I wasn't thrilled about was, well, well first off, um, in, okay, this is a difference. In the the show, Alina is the one who comes up with the idea we should go after Mordetsova's stag. And in the book, it's actually Mal's idea to go after it. And I don't really care either way. I kind of like that this is our main actress, our main character, so let's have it be her idea to go and get it. This makes her proactive. And remember, when your main character is proactive, that means that anything that happens as a consequence of what that choice is, is gonna be her fault. It will create an opportunity for blame on her part, which I gotta remember, she should be feeling a lot more guilt about um, Marie dying at some point and uh, we still haven't seen a whole lot of her thinking about how Alex Say died because of her, but maybe they're just not bringing that up. But I do, I hope that, that this is something that's not dropped. So a thoughtful writer in a second and third draft will notice these things and go, oh crap, I, I really need to make sure that my character is affected by death that is her fault. <laughs> and if not, what happens is it makes that death that happened before feel cheap or unvaluable. If it didn't affect our main character, whatever. I mean, the show has done a very good job of making the audience care about Alex A and the audience care about Marie and then killing them. So I would like to see our main actress feeling like how the audience feels. But I got a little bit sidetracked there. So back to um, going after the stag. So um, I am suspicious at this point primarily because of the book. Yeah, actually entirely because of the book. Mal has described knowing where Alina is because he can hear a high-pitched tone or something. Like he, he just can hear her. Was that in the series or in the book? I'm pretty sure that was in the book. But Alina twice brings up that she wonders if maybe people aren't aware of the gifts that they have. Like they aren't aware of the magnitude of how powerful their gifts are. Like somebody's got a talent and they think it's just normal, but turns out this is something really special. And she has brought this up twice about Mal. So I'm thinking there is something possibly magical about Mal because they said, oh, he can track down anything, right? Um, but he's specifically been able to track down her and now the stag. And he talks about how there's this high pitched sound with the stag as well. So I'm thinking he's possibly a Grisha or, and this is just a theory, he is one of Moritzova's creations or a descendant of one. I know that's wild, but it just kind of came into my head because when um, the apparat showed that book to Alina, I can't remember what all the shapes were. There was, there was a bird, there was a dragon, there was the deer, and then there was a hand. And I keep thinking, was the hand, was the hand the darkling? So was, is the darkling one of the amp, one of Moritzova's creations? Like it's his hand, because you know, he always would grab somebody or somebody would grab him and touch him and that their power would be amplified. I don't know, 
if, if this was my story, I think I'd go with that because it'd be a big surprise. Like, wait, a person can be one of these creations too? So anyway, just an idea there. But going back to Mal, I think it would be interesting if he is some sort of a magical something as well too. Like he is able to detect where the, um, where more so his creatures are and for that reason, he has a special connection. So what would the magical connection be? Maybe he's a descendant of Moritzova. Ooh, I would like that if he was a descendant of Moritzova. That's what I would do. If this is my book, you want to make it valuable to the readers. So I wouldn't reveal this until like the end of the third book. Um, or in a series, I wouldn't reveal it until the end of like the third season, if you've got one season per book. Because that's something that you could go back and then read again and pick up little hints on like, oh, that's why Mal was always able to find her because she roosts, you know, or that's why he was always able to find the, uh, that's why he's so able, easily able to find more at Sova's stag, because there is a magical connection between them. Just an idea. I don't know. Okay, so uh, moving to Alexander the Darkling. Now, this was not in the book at all, so I'm just going to briefly comment on it. Um... He, he's revealed himself to be evil, but again, we don't really see the serious, like, he definitely is evil until he gives kind of this villain speech right near the end. So we see him send the cute button guy, whose name I can't remember, Fedor? I think it's Fedor. He says, he, he sends Fedor to go and find Nina, um, who is another storyline, we're gonna talk about Nina, but um, he's he doesn't seem to have any regard for people's care or relationships. So um, he talks about how, uh, you know, what you want is, so I can't remember what the heck he said, but it's, he said something like, I'll put, I'll put the text up. He basically told Fedor something like, what you want is not important. Or maybe he said that to the gal, what was her name? Um, Zoya. I can't remember. Either way, he's starting to slowly reveal himself as a self-centered, power-hungry bad guy, but it doesn't become very clear, like, blatant until the very end, um, when he gives this sort of speech, like, the two... It actually came off as kind of blocky and awkward. You, you know, the two orphans reunited again. How quaint or how cute or something. I was like, whatever, okay, just go, just just find them. Just continue to be ambiguously evil and I can get behind that because then I'm always wondering and it's a point of tension for, do I really want my heroine to be fighting against him or is there something in him that's good that we should be seeing? You know, it, it, like I, that question is good. Um, it creates ten, uh, an emotional tension, psychological tension in any conflicts that they will have. Then I had to ask myself for one reason, why does Alexander bring David Caustic, which is um, Genya's crush, with him? He just stays in the coach waiting. And it seemed like he specifically brought him for something, but he just sits there in the coach. And then at the end, when the Darkling is like, I have no idea where the heck she's gone. Alina could be anywhere at this point. And suddenly David is like, oh, but you know, we have that ring that's on her that Jenya gave her. And I, if we're within one mile of her, I can track her. And suddenly you see Alexander go, oh, fantastic. You know, once again, proving the many, you know, uses of a duress, 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 whatever. And, uh, I just thought that was a little convenient. Like he just happens to bring this guy who isn't involved in any of the fighting at all. Why did he bring him? Was there a specific reason why he brought him? Did I miss that? If I missed that, tell me what it was in the comments. Cause I don't remember if there was a specific reason that he gave for why he brought this guy who just sat in the coach reading a book, but that's what he did. And then it's like, oh, magically the one guy you really need for tracking down Alina happens to be one of the guys you brought with you. Okay, so before moving on to Kaz and Jesper and Inej, I have to talk about Nina. This storyline, like, they were, wasn't even here in the last episode, right? It was the last episode, there was, like, nothing. And then suddenly, okay, we get more. And at this point, I'm asking, why are we following these people? Now, I know that, that Alexander was saying, like, oh, she has a connection to Zlatan, but also had a connection to Kaz and those guys because she was going to try to, I don't know, she was going to be the double agent who stops them from getting Alina. Or I, I, I'm trying to figure out how are they connected to the story that we're seeing right now of Alina and all of these guys. Like, how are they, how is what's happening with her now important to what we're going to see in this, in this um, season? And I'm not seeing it. Like, I don't see what the connection is. 
Um, so I know somebody in the comments, somebody who actually knows the series really well, she's got her own channel. I can't remember, find her in the comments. Um, she told me that these are two characters who actually do have a bigger role and that's in Six of Crows. But this is like, a, I think what she said was this is a made up, like we're, we were told that this happened, but we never saw it played out in the Six of Crows books. And so that's what the writers are doing here. And I just have to say, it's kind of coming across as, as like a fanfic. <laughs> it's very, it's very uh, teeny sort, like teens -y sort of romance. Um, you've got, I, you've got what first all starts out <laughs> looking like an alternate fantasy ending to Titanic where he's like on the door and she's on the door and you know, she warms up his heart so that he can push the door to shore. It like, gosh, door and shore. You get the idea. It, it was, it felt a little silly, but like very little has happened with these characters. She's just kind of been antagonistic towards him and called him a horrible person. And he kind of has done the same to her, but less aggressively so. And then they get to this cave and oh my gosh, they have to take their clothes off and lay naked, huddled together underneath a blanket to stay warm. She's like teasing him about his, uh, his, what do you call it, um, modesty. And it feels like they're trying to make a teen audience go like, oh, this is so sexy. And I, I'm just not feeling it. I'm just sitting there rolling my eyes going, of course they have to be naked. And of of course they've got to, you know, lay right next to each other. And of course he has to be a gentleman and she has to be like, your gentlemanly ways are stupid. It just feels ugh, not great. Um, so I wish that they didn't do that. And at the same time, I'm still wondering why we're following these people. I need to see some important thing or like a, some foreshadowing as to how that's going to weave in because they did a good job with the Kazanej and Jesper bit where we could see where it was going. We could see where it was connecting. And honestly, actually, now that they have connected and they're separated, I'm going, how are they gonna weave back in? Like, how how does that happen? So I am curious to see what they're gonna do there. But yeah, some of this stuff with Nina, and I can't remember what the heck the other guy's name is. It's just silly. Like, when he he's telling her, like, I don't like you because you're, you're nude and you know, you're, and he's like, he's got this like, I find you so incredibly sexy look on his face. And it just made me, blah. Again, like I, I rolled during this scene, maybe a dozen times. <laughs> it was just cringy. It just felt so, so surface and so forced and immature compared to what we were getting with like Kaz and Inej and all of those guys. Like the, that romance was better. The Mal and Alina romance was better. The Alina and the Darkling romance was better. What happened here? I don't know what happened here, but if this is supposed to be like, these are two really great characters coming up, they're not doing a very good job in the series of making them feel like as on par with everybody else in this ensemble. <laughs> but yeah, also Nina is not coming across as particularly likable. She um, it continues to be very antagonistic. He continues to be sort of, you know, just taking it, but also giving it back. But you, because she's starting everything, you really get the impression that he's, he's kind of throwing at, uh, insults back at her as like a defense. <laughs> like, hey, you say this about me, I'm saying this about you. It's, uh, it, yeah, it just, uh, it feels lopsided. Like, are, why am I supposed to feel any connection to Nina? There is a moment where, uh, where he talks about how, how do I know that you're not just manipulating my heart and making me feel like I like you. And it's like it, like the light bulb goes off in her head. It dawns on her, oh, I never thought of that. And I'm just going, oh, that, that, that is not a good, just the close minded and like self-centeredness of her psychology in this moment. She never once thought that maybe people would think that you're trying, that you are manipulating them. Like maybe they don't trust how they feel around you because your power is manipulating people, changing how they feel. So yeah, it's not, this is not good. And then you have that moment where she falls into the crevasse and there she he's holding on to her and he has this like deadpan look on his face and she's like, oh no, I'm gonna die and I don't wanna die. Like she has this like, we're supposed to see that she's a vulnerable person at that moment and that's what he's supposed to be thinking. So he does decide to lift her out and then there's this 
monumental moment where he takes off his his coat and he wraps it around her. It feels so it feels so opera-y or fanfic-y. Actually, fanfic is the way to go. It really feels like a fanfic. So I'm not enjoying the Nina story. I wish that I was because I think that these probably are characters that are well loved in the series. And I'll bet this is a story that is does not play out. And I, I just think that they're not doing a good job with it. The series is not doing justice to characters who are supposedly well loved because this is not how you portray characters that you're going to come to like. Um, so going forward, they can possibly save this because you can have a character who starts out as unlikable and then becomes likable. You need to start creating some humility and maybe self-awareness from Nina. We need that. And we also need to increase, I think, some of, um, what's his name? Uh, actually, I don't know his name, <laughs> the, the big burly man guy. He needs to come to her defense against his own people. I think that would be a really good way for him to 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 be portrayed as being a, an honorable, good character. Because we sort of saw it starting before, and I you need more of that to continue to make, make this thing work. Actually, I'd like to see her defend him too. That would be a good one. I like, I'd like that. Okay, moving on to Kaz and those guys. So I, <laughs> I thought it was a little silly that Kaz and Jesper got blinded, but okay, that's how Alina gets away from them. And for some reason, it was so shocking to Kaz and Jesper, but not to Inej. Like she just blinked. I, I don't know how she wasn't affected by the flash, but whatever. That's how Alina gets away from them. I didn't mind it. I was a little sad that they didn't have more interaction. I was really looking forward to seeing their interaction, but now it's not happening. So I'm hoping that they meet up again. I was not happy though with Kaz seeming to forget that Inej killed somebody to save his life. Like he seemed to be very aware of that at the end of the last episode, but now he's upset at her for letting the target go. And it seems to me like he should realize that she did such a huge thing by killing somebody in order to save him that maybe that would give a little a, a little forgiveness in her direction, you know, like, okay, it's all right that you let her go. Like, I can understand him being angry about it and maybe fighting that anger, but he was not put in the best light in this instance. Um, also his denial of this, of Alina being an actual sun summoner. So Kaz has, at least in the likability meter, has gone down a smidge, but we're liking Inej because we're on her side in these things. We understand why she's done the things that she does. And because we know that Kaz seems to be in a good connection with, have a good connection with her and has done other good things for her, especially when he brings up the fact that the Crows Club or Nest, I can't remember what it's called, he's, he gave the deed to um, Helene. We know that he's a good person. He's just behaving badly in this moment. So he, this better not last. I want to see him step back up and like, okay, I understand why you did it. I'm just angry about it. And it really has cost us a lot. So we've got to make up for it. I mean, she's injured now too. So by the end of this, anyway. I did really enjoy the fight between Inej and the firebender. Thought it was great, really enjoyed it. I like that she got hurt. Not that I wanna see a character that I enjoy get hurt, but it's always good to put your protagonists that you want to see succeed through real danger. So um, I do hope that that this injury becomes something more. Um, otherwise, it was just a way for us to feel sorry for her and it has no significance uh, going forward. Um, you want to have, if something like that happens, it affects how they behave in the future. I also really liked that once again, the reason she kills the firebender girl is because she, the firebender girl threatened her, her friends, said, I will kill everyone that you love and then I'll kill you. And that's why she, you know, she's like, I will, I'm relentless. I will never give up. And that's when she takes the knife out and like, okay, then I guess I have to kill you. I like that the one thing that she could possibly put above her devotion to this tenet of her faith, which is, you know, thou shalt not kill, I guess, is love. And it's a defensive love. Like my friends, my loved ones are going to die if I don't kill this person. And so that's like, the, that's a pretty big monumental thing. So I do hope that this is something that's further explored with Inej. There's a lot that you can do with it where she struggles with her faith and, and justifying this thing. But at the same time, I like that they are like, okay, she really struggled with it the first time, struggled less hard with it this time. Now maybe she should struggle with the fact that she's struggling with it less. 
if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, the fight with Jesper and the uh, and Ivan, Ivan. I liked this too, and I have a question. So it seems to me that heart renders have to be able to see their target in order to affect them, because why? If if proximity is what it is, then he should have been able to get Jesper or figure out where he is or something. Or you know, before pushing the curtain open, when he saw the little kid, he should have frozen their heart or something before pushing the curtain open. So you have to be able to see them. I like how Jesper took him out, that he shot him several times in the same spot and it actually did cause damage or pain at least so that Jesper could do something. Jesper was merciful, very nice. I also caught that not so subtle hint, but maybe you would have missed it if you didn't listen really hard. Yvonne says, what are you? And he's about to say, you are a something, but Jesper quickly silences him before he can finish that thought. So Jesper is something special. I'm guessing he's he's got some sort of a ranking as, you know, maybe his training was really, really special or you know, because he's, a, he's super good with his pistol. So he's possibly known as uh, his p group, his people or, you know, s organization that he's part of, they are highly specialized. And for some reason, he's keeping it a secret. He's keeping this hidden. So why would you keep that hidden? Is it a group that the government is, has disbanded or are they, were, were they supposedly wiped off the face of the earth or something, but, oh, he's a remnant, like he's still there and people thought there weren't any left, but here he is. So I'm curious to see where that goes. Very intriguing with that. I was also, very afraid for Kaz when he faced off against the Darkling. Like I thought, oh my gosh, Kaz, you're gonna need some help because we've seen in the past, he he can't stand up to Grisha. He, he tried to, he almost got away with it, but in the end he needed an edge to save him. So I was expecting that there was going to be something major that happens here, like a consequence, but I, I found his escape believable. And I found it more believable than Alina's escape. So Alina escaping from Kaz and Jesper by blinding them is less believable because these are two people who, I mean, it, it was daytime outside. Was the flash really that bright? I guess it had to be a bit, whatever. It, that was, it felt a little bit convenient. But with the Darkling, I could easily see that a flash of bright light is, is you know, it's, it's his antithesis. It is the thing that is his weakness. So to flash a bright light in front of the Darkling, that might actually work. So they 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 got away with it. <laughs> Kaz was able to get away with it because it was specifically the Darkling that he was facing off against. But I would like to see that if Kaz does face the Darkling again, the Darkling is ready for it. Um, he doesn't fall for the flashbang the second time. And I'd like to see he, Kaz either has to be rescued or he is severely injured, almost killed, or something like that. that that's what you want to do with this sort of storyline going forward. Is you've seen them face off once, and the, the uh, what do you call it, the, the conflict didn't happen. So it's like we're waiting for this conflict to happen again, and the next time it does happen, it better be very different. So my thoughts on the episode so far, there was stuff about it I enjoyed, but there were stuff about it that clearly had some flaws, especially the Nina story. But um, the book did do some things right in the beginning in making Alina feel a little bit more self, not self-aware, but more mature, you know, and I liked knowing in, that in her head, she had some reflection on her being manipulated by the Darkling. But uh, anyway, let me know. Did you catch anything from the, the series, the show that I didn't catch? Uh, I wish that I could remember all the details that happened. It's tough for me to separate the two at this point, but I'm doing my best. I've only got, what, two more episodes left, so I am excited to see how season one ends. But otherwise, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you're feeling really generous, check out my Patreon or Ko-fi. And uh, I guess that's it. Be good to yourself. Mm -hmm.